now. Five, five is it? Go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> I think I've put that on record too. Yes. Good day. Um, I want to present something to you just in the last little bit of our time together, which might just help sort of expand your concept of what's normal. Um, when, when God, when the first human pair came to the planet, um, they, there was no one before them. Like the, so I'm talking now about the people you would know of from a Bible perspective of that Adam and Eve. Right? And actual names of are Ammon and Aman. And they, uh, they, when they came to the earth, they, in, they incarnated onto the earth into a body that had been created for them. And, and they don't have any, they didn't have any consciousness of anyone else existing before them and there was nobody else on the earth before them either and so what was normal for them was vastly different to what is normal for us as you can imagine and what I'd like to do is just talk to you about how our version of normal came about do you mind if I mention that with you so if you can remember if you can think that uh, there's these first human couple who were created. Their souls, of course, were created, but they were physical bodies were created and their spirit bodies were created by God. They didn't have a parent in the sense that we have a parent, in the sense that there was no conception that took place to create them. Um, there was no gestation period. They actually incarnated into adult bodies. So it's a very unique experience for them to incarnate into adult bodies. And they basically grew through the experience of coming into a connection with their adult body. By the way, you have the ability to communicate with these two spirits uh, who still live in the spirit world at the moment. So you could find out the things that I'm going to tell you about now from them directly. But what happened was that... Uh, when they decided, they made a decision, and the decision was basically this. The decision was, we want to be God. That was their decision. They wanted to be the same as God. They wanted to have complete self-determination. They didn't want to be God-reliant. They decided, it was a decision they made in their heart uh, that they then acted upon, that they wanted to disconnect from God. They, wanted to, they felt that, uh, that they would be able to have God's power if they decided to separate from God. And uh, of course now they realise that that choice or decision was quite fanciful and ludicrous actually. But at the time, that was the decision that they had made. <coughs> now in that process, um, what happened was a number of things happened instantly to their soul. So their soul, what happened, so if you think of them as they still had a, have a soul, there was half of a soul, the male half, connected to the bodies. And then on the female side, there's the female half, the person that you know is Eve, connected to her bodies, spirit and material bodies. And to de together they made this choice to, be, to try to be like God and, and to put in an effort to do so and to disconnect from God. In the process, their soul degraded. And the instant that their soul degraded, it instantly, there was an instant reflection in their environment. Now before then, <coughs> they didn't have to grow anything to eat. They, uh, everything around them reflected their condition. So all the, tre all the trees and the animals and the plants and everything reflected their condition. So, so they didn't have to grow food. They didn't have to toil to grow food. They didn't have to plant food. It all just automatically grew up around them exactly what they wanted. They didn't have to do anything. 
And the animals also would come to them, like the animals would just come and sit on them and, and basically what you would view as communicating with them, the animals would just come. So that was really enjoyable for them as well. As soon as they made this choice, none of the animals would come to them anymore. All of the animals were instantly afraid of them from that moment on. Um, they also um, started to age for the first time and they noticed it. Um, there was a quite a rapid uh, deceleration in their condition and they started to get lines on their face, um, you know what we call wrinkles. <laughs> And uh, all of those kind of things started happening quite rapidly, actually, after this degradation occurred in their soul. So there was an instant reflection of the change in their condition. They actually saw it immediately. Right? Now you think about how that would have affected them for a moment. And you can start to see, you start to feel like, whoa, we've made a much bigger decision than what we probably thought we'd made. Yeah? Now, already those three particular things, the thing where they, couldn't, uh, no, they could no longer, they had to now plant their food. They could not automatically hope to have food without them doing some physical labour or physical effort. They also could no longer expect animals to just come up to them anymore and engage with the animals anymore. The an animals fled them. And the animals actually started attacking each other as well after this began. And when by the time their children were born, um, the animals started doing this quite a lot, actually. So it was an instant reflection of their condition. But they had the advantage, I suppose you could call it, of an instant reflection of a change in their condition in a negative direction. So they could see what was going on all of a sudden in comparison to what was going on before. Does that make sense? And this is the problem we have, is that we've got nothing to compare our reality with. And so therefore, when animals don't come up and sit on us, uh, I mean wild animals and birds and everything, we view that as normal. Right? When we've got to go out and dig a hole and plant a tree before it will grow, and we've got to cultivate the soil in order to eat, we view that as normal. Right? When we see lines appearing on our face, we view that as normal. When we even see somebody die, even though it hits us pretty hard in our heart, we still tell ourselves that it's normal. Can you see that? The reason why we do that is because we've got nothing to compare normal with. So right at the beginning, if you could say this is our, was the condition of mankind, which was a sixth sphere soul condition, very rapidly the condition of mankind reduced down to this condition, which is an, a first sphere condition, which is now. Right? The problem with living in this time frame or in this time frame or in this time frame or in this time frame is we've got nothing to compare it with and therefore we view it as we think that is normal. For, these, for the first human couple when that happened and then that happened and they saw this degradation occur they could see that there's a huge difference between that and that and therefore they could see that it was not normal. Right. But for us, we just see life going on as it's always gone on. People die, people are born, people will grow old, people have wrinkles, and so on. And we view, and we have diseases, and we view it all as normal. And none of it's normal. None of it is our normal way of life. But we accept it as normal because of a thing that people call conditioning right. conditioning has a huge effect on your faith in God and in your ability to grow as a soul conditioning you, 
often we have conditioned ourselves that growth is not possible. We're, we're basically telling ourselves a lot of the time that we, it's not possible to be any different than we currently are. When the reality is we're just having a, an unreal view of normal. You see, I would argue that this condition, even for mankind without God, this condition is normal. The condition that they began in, that's normal. And in that condition, I don't have to grow my own food. It all grows up around me. In that condition, all the animals will come to me. In, fact, in that condition, I don't have all this emotional baggage to work my way through in that condition. Right? That's normal. What we're going through now is not normal. It's abnormal. It's way different than normal. And we have become so conditioned that this is normal that we have very little faith that normal is that condition. So we forget really easily that that's normal. So sometimes what happens when I talk with a group about the soul or about diseases or about anything else, we're so used to thinking that disease is normal. We're so used to thinking that it's normal to cry when somebody dies. We're so used to thinking that somebody dying is normal. We're so used to thinking a lot of different things that are nothing to do with normal. They are to do with our creation, mankind's creation, when we walked away from God, when we wanted to become gods ourselves. That caused us to then have a misconception of what is normal. And what I'd like you to just think about for a little bit is how your concept of what is normal causes you to not allow your imagination or your faith to grow. How you try to shut yourself down and it doesn't allow you to think positively about what is possible. So, so unfortunately what happens when we're here and we think that's normal, we look at that and you know what we call that? We call that a miracle. Right? We, we call normal a miracle. And there'll be many things that happen in the future on the planet, I feel, that we will call miracles that'll actually just be normal in terms of what God normally created us to be. Yeah. And what we need to do is we no need to start seeing that state as normal rather than still continuing to see this state as normal. You see, the world, what I call the world, the world of people, want you to believe that this concept of normal is another term they use. Is real, or they call it reality, you see. And when you can see this viewpoint as normal, they go, you are you're crazy now. <laughs> right? But I put to you who is crazy. Isn't it the people who have accepted this as normal when it's not normal? When it doesn't have to be normal. And so, unfortunately, terms like reality have a lot of emotional charge in them now. Because people want us to believe that what they believe is normal is real. And therefore what we believe is crazy. And we need to start allowing ourselves to start having concepts, even inside of our own mind, let alone our own heart, that actually are no longer the accepted norm or accepted as normal. We need to allow ourselves to start perceiving what we believe would be a miracle can be something that happens every day. So, so, for example, it even affects our day-to-day -day life in terms of our enjoyment of life. Many of us believe that it's not possible to be happy 24 by 7. I remember talking to a psychologist, and this was some time ago. Uh, I was sitting in a waiting room, actually, and there happened to be a psychologist sitting next to me in this waiting room. And, and I, said to, I said to him, he looked pretty sad, and I said to him, oh, you look fairly sad. And he says to me... He said, yeah, I probably am, he says. He said, but you know what the problem is? It's not possible to be happy all the time. I said, okay. Why do you say that? 
He said, it was just not possible. You look at everybody on the planet, nobody's happy all the time. So it's not possible to be happy all the time. So what was he doing? He was telling me that because he observed on the planet what he believed was normal, then the other thing which was possible, he could, even, could not even accept as possible. So he's basically stopping himself from ever conceiving that complete happiness was even possible by examining what he believed was normal, which is really very abnormal. And when, you know, when we had this discussion, this was 15 years ago now, um, it, we had this discussion, I, I felt quite overwhelmed with his sadness because he was actually so sad telling me about his disillusionment with happiness, that happiness was not even possible. And this is one of the other problems I see with all of this is that a lot of times many of us even would think that it's a miracle that we would be happy all day, every day. We don't even think that's possible. Uh, and we'd view that as utopia, a utopian dream, or a concept that a crazy person would have. Yeah. And the problem with any of these um, conditionings that we uh, have been involved in in our life is we end up with this idea of what, of what God created is crazy and therefore not achievable. And what man created, which is here, that's what man created, we view that as reality and normal. And can you see, if we continue to hold on to that concept, our growth is going to be very severely affected, not only as an individual, but also as a human race. If we hold on to the concept that change is not possible and that happiness is not possible and that, that what is currently seemingly reality is not reality, if we, if we hold on to the concept that it is reality, then we're going to end up in a very hopeless situation where we don't believe our own growth even is possible. Whereas if we start seeing that this is reality, as God created it to be, and this is unreality, then we have some ability then to actually confront what the society believes is normal. You think about your day-to-day -day life, what's one of the biggest fears that you have? Isn't it the fear that you'll be viewed as crazy or abnormal? Isn't that the big, one of the biggest fears? Now, I, if you look at every person in history that's ever, ever moved humanity forward, they have always been viewed as crazy by their peers. And there's, that's always the case with almost every, every person historically. It starts off with them being viewed as crazy, or even before then, that, uh, or usually after then, they're viewed angrily, in other words, they're attacked, and then they're accepted, and then they're often honoured. <laughs> All in one lifetime, many of them have go through this procedure, right? And what I'm suggesting is that if we hold on to this concept of normal, the world's concept of normal, and even our own concept of normal, which has been highly defined by the world's concept of normal, and if we hold on to that, we have no capacity to actually change to what God views as normal. But if we allow our minds, at least even our minds, to conceive that what we have on the planet today as normal, including the fact that animals are scared of us and they kill each other for food, including the fact that we have diseases, including the fact that we grow old and we die, including the, all of these facts that appear as reality, and if we see them no longer as reality, but rather just as the creation of a person who has walked away from God and truth, then we'll, we'll at least have some hope that things can change and therefore have a desire to change. We'll at least do that. And that's what I'd encourage you to do, is to confront the world's viewpoint of normal in your day-to-day -day life. Jessica, can wait for the mic. Oh. 
<laughs> You're terrible with this mic. <laughs> I said a few times to people that uh, that is not normal. And, and they all think I'm crazy. Exactly. I <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said God didn't create that. But did God create that? Well, no, <laughs> God didn't create this state here, did she? She created this state here yeah. and man created this state here. So although it is a reality that man has created this state, it is not the reality of what is possible. What is possible is this. Yeah. Right? And if, if, if we can hold on to what is possible and have some faith about what is possible yeah. and have some faith about God's nature, that God would not have created the world as it is, but rather as to what it was possible to be. Yeah. Can we call it divine norm? This one, divine norm. Yeah, <laughs> that's what too. You want to call it divine normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reality is there is probably no divine normal, because um, because because if you think about it, our soul, this state here, is only the beginning of the capacity of our soul to grow, and that being the case, we can grow beyond that point, and our soul can continuously expand. So we have the potential to infinitely expand not just to be limited to a certain condition. And so because of that, there is no normal in terms of what would be limited to. We can only have eternal, eternal expansion. But this is what I feel is the normal for mankind. Like we are, without God, are able to achieve this normal. Without God, we're able to achieve that normal. And yet we're way down here believing this to be normal. Yeah. So a person doesn't have to believe in God even to see this as the potential of being normal. Yeah. And when you think about what drives a lot of scientific discoveries, isn't it that fact that they want things to change? Like, why are they working on the so-called death gene? Well, there's a gene in your body, a, 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 in your body's genetic structure, that causes you to die, they've found. It causes you to grow old and get wrinkly and die over a period of time. And scientists have discovered the gene. They know the exact gene it is in the chromosome. Right? And in the, in the um, what's it called? The ribonucleic acid, which is the, well, the, the deoxyribonucleic acid, which is DNA. Um, they've, they've found the exact gene that causes your death. They don't know why it's there. They, they're now experimenting with removing it or trying to remove it. Right? Well, it, it, they don't understand the cause of why this gene is present. And the gene is present because of that was the normal condition without the gene, and this is the condition with the gene. Right? Even the genetic structure of our own body is severely impacted by what we believe is normal, which is not what is normal. This is normal. And, and this is something that we need to understand ourselves and confront within the society around us. And I don't mean you have to be angry about it. It's just a matter of confronting it by talking about potentials that are, that are not viewed by the world as normal. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to raise that with you because <coughs> if we don't do this, we are going to continue on the merry way of time. So as time progresses through life, we're going to keep accepting what our previous parents accepted as normal. And, and can you see that if I start to no longer accept that as normal and I start to return back to what God views as normal, then any person who believes that is normal is going to be confronted by my behaviour. Can you see that? So it is impossible for people around you to not be confronted by your change. It's impossible. And while I am so afraid of them attacking me about my change, I am obviously going to be very tempted to stay on this line rather than go on this line. But this is the line we need to go. Not only individually, but as a whole society, we need to go in that direction. If we go in this direction, we're going to end up with exactly the same results as we've always gotten. In other words, we'll look in the mirror when we're 30 and there'll be a line or two there. And when we're 40, there'll be more lines. And when we're 50, there'll be more. And when we're 60 or 70 or 80, we may be lying on our bed looking in the mirror. 
And when we're 90, we might not be here at all just because of what we believe is normal. And when we get diseases, when we search for a human solution to many of these diseases, when I say a human solution, when we search for a medical solution addressing the effect, then we're not seeing what's normal from God's perspective. We're only accepting the normal of the world. We need to change. We need to grow from that condition. Mary? Just down with Mary. Thanks. <coughs> I think when you talk about that, um, I'm reminded of the guy in the waiting room who was so sad and the disillusionment in him because it feels like um, it takes a lot of faith personally to personally change. It's not just the fear of being viewed as crazy, which mm -hmm. I have, mm -hmm. but it's also this deep sadness in me that is triggered as I try to like lift off that uh, world's view of normal mm. and this fear that I'll go for something and I won't be able to do it uh, you know I'll, I'll step out and I'll say no God I have faith that I can live a different way mm. and I can have a different reality and I can create a different reality mm. Th there's this like this really childlike <coughs> fear grief thing in me of I'm going to go for that and then I'll fail yeah and then I won't just be crazy I'll be stupid and crazy I yeah. suppose is the or fear. a failure and crazy a failure and it's crazy, okay yeah. to be a successful crazy person <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I'm comfortable with this <laughs> successful craziness yet <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and that, uh, this is a problem that we face is that we have many internal reasons as well why we do not embrace a more positive viewpoint of life. And one of the internal reasons is that if we do embrace a positive viewpoint of life and our viewpoint is disappointed, then we feel we'll have extra grief to feel than we would have had if we just ignored the positive and went on as we are. It's not really true that we have extra grief though, is it? It no. just uncovers the already grief inside it, of us. Yes, it uncovers the, already, the grief that already appears there. And mm. so it's likely that we're going to have to pass through those moments of feeling like, wow, I'm stepping out of n normal, going for God's normal and I feel crazy and it's failing and, and feel that grief before yes. we're actually going to achieve God's normal. Because that is one grief that is an impediment to our changing our viewpoint. And it is a grief we have to experience. Yeah. And this is why many of us feel severely challenged by living in an environment that disagrees with our opinion. You get, because we do have these emotions inside that we want everybody to agree with our opinion so that it's safe for us to actually have our opinion. So we have a lot of fear that we need to address. Yeah. And Just hang on a second. Oh, I'm just getting emotional now. But it, it makes me think about, you know, John Lennon's song, Imagine. Yeah. It's such a beautiful kind of just statement in his song. And even, I feel like even the act of imagining sometimes is brave. Yes. Because it challenges all those grief and fear emotions within us. And, yep. and I know that many times I'm still afraid to even imagine because of the grief that it brings up. Yeah. Yes. The very first people who started working on diseases had to firstly imagine that there was a, a, a cause of a disease that they couldn't actually see. That they eventually found a way by using microscopes and lenses and everything that they could eventually see. But they had to actually firstly imagine that there must be a cause they couldn't see. Does that make sense? And those people were called crazy by other people. Right, it's the very first people that you know actually did flight, and I've brought this up quite a lot with people. They were viewed as crazy by other people, like you know, flying's meant for birds, not for us. And if God had wanted us to fly, He would have given us wings, and all these kind of re reasonings, you know, which are all not very logical, um, are all used in order to keep us in this statement of normal, of in this statement of reality. And I feel that the biggest change, one of the biggest changes we can make internally is to start actually having a different viewpoint of what we view as possible. We need to start seeing that there are many other possibilities that we are very, very closed to experiencing. And if we can then tie that to the soul... 
In other words, understand that the soul is the biggest defining thing within our lives as to what our lives create. Then we'll start seeing a totally different reality. That every single thing around us can be changed, not by us going out into the world and physically changing it or killing it, but rather by ourselves changing ourselves first. Then everything around can change. And this brings us uh, the onus on back onto us as an individual. That if each of us change as an individual, now we have the potential to change our environment. But if, if, if none of us change as individuals, then how can we expect our environment to change? Yeah. So I just wanted to raise that with you as to this idea that, you know, there's... Uh, this problem that we face is that we no longer have an instant reflection of our condition. Do you know what I mean by that? What's happening is because we're not falling from a position that's up here down to here and historically mankind's already fell from that condition to this because we are now generally in this condition all of us what we then do is we go into this place of thinking that that is normal and that we can't really see the results of our negative actions. But the results of our negative actions, of our soul condition being exercised in an unloving, unloving manner, are surrounding us every moment of our day. And everything that's happening in the world is a complete reflection of the collective condition being added together, viewing this as normal. Wars are happening. Right now, you know, there's 50 million children who are aborted every year. 50 million children die every year through abortion. Then you've got another 50 million children around about every single year die through starvation by the time they're five years of age. Now, these things shouldn't be happening in a normal society where there's plenty of food to feed everybody. But we view them. We, we barely go through a moment in a day where we even think about it happening. And the reason why is because we view it as normal and we don't believe it can change. You see, if we didn't view it as normal, we wouldn't accept it. But because we view it as normal, we accept it. You know? and, and there's many countries of the world right now where literally most of the what you would call the private population of the country is in exile from the country where they've been abused so badly, tortured, abused, raped, and many of them are living on the border of their own country, in refugee camps. Right? Now, in a normal society, we all, like Australia alone has enough resources to bring all of those people here and settle them all here. Just one country has enough resources to do that. And yet it doesn't happen because it's not normal. Because we want to, it's normal for you to go and get a passport, isn't it? You know, you get your photograph taken, you get a passport if you want to go overseas. How crazy is that? Like we're world citizens and we need a passport to go into a different country. Sometimes a different country is just a line on the ground drawn by somebody. And often it's in dispute as well. And yet if I cross that border, I'm now illegally there. And that's treated as normal. It's treated as normal that you have to buy your own water. How crazy is that? Like you think about it, like every single person on the planet needs water to survive. You don't have water for a few days and you're already on the way out, right? And yet we've got to buy it? Every single planet person on the planet has to buy food, just about every single person. How crazy is that? That's normal now, but it's crazy. Like anything that's essential for life shouldn't have to be bought. It should, it should automatically be, be given by society, by people working together to give it. And so there's all these realities. There's realities, if you look at it, there's political reality, what we call political. So in politics, how much of that's normal? Like in, dem in democracy, less than 50% of the people are happy at any one point in time. Now, does that, that's normal in our democratic environment. Do you, do you think that sounds normal to you, or does that sound a bit crazy? And then you've got in religion. 
they all there's obviously only one God and yet they all worship their God in a different way and then to make it worse when they disagree with how they worship God they'll generally argue and fight but they'll even kill each other Histor historically we've had wars caused by the disagreements of religious viewpoint is that that's normal it sounds crazy to me and then you look at eco economics you look at the world's economic system somebody right over the other side of the world determines right, through a whole series of interactions how much worth your house is right now that you live in does that sound normal <laughs> to you what about um, how we go about interacting with each other economically does it sound normal that that if I if I got a piece of paper you know like just this piece of paper here would probably do us and I told you that's the new ten thousand dollar note in Australia would any of you believe me <laughs> probably not right and yet all of us have accepted what our government has said is a hundred dollar note a fifty dollar note a twenty dollar note five dollar note two dollar coin one dollar coin we've all accepted it and yet it's just plastic it has no worth it can't do anything for you it can buy things because we all have accepted the value but but it, if all of a sudden there was some kind of th disaster that occurred do you think it would have any value none at all so we accept something as normal even the monetary system as normal and we could keep going couldn't we the medical system what do we accept as normal? Sickness is normal. We actually have entire healthcare systems dedicated to the removal of effects of diseases. Billions and billions and billions of your money, dollars, goes to the acceptance of what is normal in the medical system. Yeah. And what about education? Another system. What's normal? Nowadays, it's normal to have to pay for your education. Now, does that make much sense? Like anybody who wants to learn has to pay for it. Anybody who doesn't want to learn doesn't have to pay anything. Shouldn't it be the other way around? If it was going to be anything, <laughs> where if you don't want to learn, you have to pay. <laughs> and if you do want to learn, then you should be given it for free. Like, wouldn't that make much more sense in a society? And yet we accept that system as normal. We also we accept so many things in all of this. We we also accept as normal a lot of the times that we get a piece of paper, and that tells us that we're qualified now. Right? And yet you've had no experience a lot of times. You've had no real life experience or whatever. And then years later you get the real life experience, and then you look at the piece of paper and go, "Wow, when I got that piece of paper, I didn't have a clue <laughs> of what I was doing then." And that's the education system. All of these systems are all normal or viewed as normal and yet they're just totally crazy. The legal system, you could keep going on and on and on with all these systems, couldn't you? Now, can you see that if you decide to make this step, this transition into raising this, the bar, if you like, of what is normal, can you see that every single one of these systems is going to have to be confronted? at some point and it doesn't have to be confronted with guns or you know violence it just is confronted by your change in attitude to what is generally viewed as normal yeah so my, my suggestion is to allow yourself to have a bit of reflection time and think about all the things you accept as normal and then ask yourself the question if God was here next to me right now what would he tell me about what is normal and what isn't normal yeah it's just a thought and um, it's time to finish i feel um, what i'd like to do is uh um what have we decided what we're going to do tomorrow or tomorrow. no
No, we haven't. <laughs> but uh, we also, uh, someone's interested in uh, maybe starting a meeting group here in Adelaide. Oh, who was that? That was yourself, Phoebe. Phoebe. Um, so you'd like to start a meeting group here? And Phoebe, are you willing to address issues of love in the group? Absolutely. Absolutely? <laughs> That's awesome. What we find a lot of the times is when people want to start a group, they sort of hopeful that everybody who comes along will automatically be loving yeah. and, and that's not always the case, right? Yeah. And it's very yeah. important to address the issues of the lack of love in a group. Yeah. So Phoebe, can you give me, you're happy to give me your contact details? Yeah, yep, sure. So my email address is Phoebe, P-H-O-E-B-E, -E. Bruce, B-R-U-C-E. B-R-U-C-E. Zero nine at gmail.com. And, and what were you thinking of doing? Phoebe? Well, I mean, I, I guess I'd be happy to. You open were hoping up somebody else was going to do it. Is that? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I have a desire to, having recently moved back to Adelaide, to connect with people who are also interested in divine truth. Yeah. Yeah. And if nothing more than just to create a space where people where we can come together and talk about whatever's going on yeah. for us. Um, I can, really I, can I make a few suggestions? Sure. What uh, a lot of groups are finding it is good is uh, some of them are, are doing uh, Mary's book study group with each other, like yeah. every week. Some are also doing a thing where they show some snippets of, of different videos or whatever and then they um, discuss the, you know, the, the things or what they feel about those particular things. So yeah. the key with any group is to not waste your time just discussing everybody's feelings all the time yeah. because that is a very personal thing and you can often get very distracted and waylaid doing that. It's far better off if you have some material that, is, that can be presented. Sure, yeah. yeah. And because uh, you're wanting to do that, um, I'd like to catch up with you and give you a gift as well of a hard disk drive which has all of our talks for the last four years on it. Okay. Um, and we'll give it to Phoebe, that drive that I created. I left it out of the room. Yep. So I'm I'll have to give it to you tomorrow, tomorrow if you're yeah. around. Yep. Yep. And, and anybody who wants to have a copy of those movies, if you could just copy it off for them. Yeah, that, sure. That'd be wonderful sure. if you have a computer. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I can give my phone number as well, if that would be... Um, it's probably better not, a, not on YouTube. Um, so oh what okay. if we sure, just sure, sure. stop the videos now? Yep. And stop the recording as well. And then... How many people are interested in Phoebe's group? There's only a few who are actually based here in Adelaide, isn't there? Yeah. 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 Only a few. Because you've got the guys that you've got, you guys down the Riverland, aren't you? So you probably won't have too many initially. Yeah, yeah. And the key with any group is that as you grow, you'll find you'll attract. Yeah. Yeah, it's always the same. Yeah. So some groups have stopped, started off very small and become very large very quickly, depending on how the person who's led the group has changed. Yeah. And other groups have actually started large and got very small, depending on how the group, the person who leads the group has changed. Yeah. Yeah. So what we'd like to do is just mention how to deal with issues in love so in terms of like with attack. So if you do hold a group of any kind, and this applies by the way not just to a group about divine love, but to any type of group you could ever have. 
So it's, it's not like these principles are in any group. The issue is, if a person attacks verbally or, slander. or slanders, yeah. Whatever. Another. Then what we need to do is work out what we would do. Now the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to point out to them that they are now acting in an unloving manner. And if they are going to continue acting in an unloving manner, we will have to ask them to leave. And if they are still going to act in an unloving manner and come back again, then we're going to have to ask them to permanently leave until they've addressed the issue as to why they wish to slander or to attack somebody verbally. And it doesn't matter whether the person being attacked deserved it in anybody's eyes or not, by the way. So in a group, and just recently I gave a talk which is not on YouTube yet, is it? it's about free will and the restriction of people's free will. And my suggestion for anybody who wants to hold a group or a Facebook page or anything like that is to have a look at the principles we raised in that interview. It was an interview between myself and Mary um, that was done in front of a seminar um, on the subject of free will and what the general principles about the gift of free will are from God's perspective. Because in that you will actually see that it's okay to restrict somebody's free will if you do it out in love. And you also do it in terms of, you know, you're not angry or upset with the person, but rather you just want to help them to become more loving. And it's very important to understand the principles of free will. So what I would do for any person who's holding a group of any kind, whether it's on the net or, you know, in physical, is to examine the principles of free will. The free will discussion. The whole discussion is called the human soul, the gift of free will. And if you could, uh, if you watch that, you will have a good idea of how to do or address issues where people attack other people. Now, myself and Mary don't treat an attack of ourselves as any different to an attack on somebody else. So, so if if we were sitting down in a group and you know, like Joy was being attacked, we would have the same reaction as if we were sitting down in the group and I was being attacked. Does that make sense? It's exactly the same principle in that nobody deserves to be attacked in a, in a group, particularly in a group that is trying to grow in love. And so we would firstly address the attacker and if addressing the attacker doesn't work then we would no longer include the attacker in the group. Yeah. Mary? We have to uh, We need to, we're recording this so we need to. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, the no, voice button hasn't started, does no. it? But we've got. Sorry. So we haven't actually got the voice. Sorry, I'm just. Now we'll get some voice. Okay. We can't neglect humility, though. That personally. And. So what are you? What's your comment, really, darling? Like you're, you're trying to make a comment, so so make the comment. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> we can't neglect the fact that we've attracted something yes. which has caused an emotional response in us. Yes. We can and if we are to act in love, then we will be humble to that. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that we will accept it as no. an ongoing problem. So so what Mary's saying is if somebody in the group is angry so so you've got a person in the group who's angry with either somebody else so he's angry or or upset or verbally attacking or or slandering another person telling lies about another person you know saying things that are not true about another person so there's obviously anger motivating a lot of this discussion a lot of this problem towards any other person whether that person is in the group or not is immaterial so it can be any other person in the world right then, then what we would do first is address inside of the person like what's going on. But we have to, if, if we're a member of this group, we have to also see it as our attraction, as something that we have personally attracted. But that doesn't mean we have to accept the attraction in terms of an ongoing situation. So, so to give you an example, um, when I was overseas in England, and I think there might be a recording of this now on the net, 
in London. Was the London one on the net? Yeah. Um, there was a man in the audience, so he was on my uh, right hand side, um, who basically he's just started taking up all of the conversation. And I answered him, but then he kept interrupting my answers to other people. And eventually I had to say to him, look, you've got to stop doing that or I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And he wouldn't stop doing that. And in fact, he then thought I was being unfair with him. <laughs> and so I asked him to leave and he, and he left. Right? And if he hadn't have left, I would have actually firstly either called the police. And if that didn't work, I would have actually closed the entire group down and then not invited him specifically to the next group. Does that make sense? And um, that's what happened in Sweden. We had a person, another man, come along in the second uh, presentation in Sweden and he started attacking, um, being quite attacking and derisive of many people in the group actually as well. And then there was a whole anger between the group and him and which I had to address and addressed all those issues. But he then still felt angry and so... Um, and was still being quite outspoken. He, 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 he wouldn't put up his hand, he just yelled out his comments and so forth. And so eventually I just said to him, look, you've got to leave. He refused to leave. And so I got somebody to call the police, but the police couldn't come straight away um, for, for a number of different reasons. And, um, and so I said, right, well, the group's finished. So the group just stopped th there and then, and we just stopped the entire group. And I purposely said to him, you're not invited to the next group. And he didn't come to the next group. So we need to be firm about what's unloving behaviour in a group. On the uh, Facebook page, like there was a number of issues. I brought up a number of things and it wasn't being addressed and I left. Yep. Um, occasionally I'll go have a look, see how it's going. And in the last three, four five weeks at least, I noticed that Gemma has done an amazing job on changing the atmosphere by doing the things that we've just discussed. Yes, what happened with that page is that Gemma event emailed me. We, myself and Mary observed these things going on, obviously. Um, but, but Gemma, the person who started the page, uh, emailed me and talked about what's going on with the page and so forth. Myself and Mary don't have Facebook. Um, so we, we don't we just hear from other people what's happening um, and uh, and so I actually discussed with her and made a quite a few comments to her about free will the issue of free will and all the different principles involved and then she's gone ahead with her own choices and decisions as to what she's doing some of them most of the choices and decisions are good and she's cleaning up the <laughs> place and and what that does is it raises the condition of the whole group into not accepting behaviour that's unloving anymore. So there were many people on that forum who were very unloving towards each other, towards me and myself and other people. And, and in the process of Gemma going through these emotions, which was her fear about confronting people, um, she's sorted out quite a lot of the issues, which have been excellent to sort out. Yeah, Mary? I was just going to say that uh, the feeling I have more and more now is that when we are truly humble, we act more often. Yes, not less often. Not less often. It's yeah. not, oh, it's my law of attraction, I'll just handle that, and I'll just feel, feel, not do anything. It's yeah. actually that when I'm really humble, then I honour truth and love more, and I actually act more, but well I don't blame really as much. Well, the emotion really that we is need it? is courage. Yeah. The courage to live in harmony with love and truth. You see, the mo most of the reasons why we avoid that, and Gemma admitted to me in her e private exchanges with me, was most of the reasons why she was avoiding doing that is because she saw all the unloving behaviour on the forum that she created, but then she knew that if she addressed some of it, that that all unloving behaviour would come towards her. right? And so, <coughs> so what she did was she avoided the confrontation of the unloving behaviour because of her fear of herself being attacked. Does that make sense? And this is what we often do. We avoid, and this is where in groups, if you do have groups, it's, it's great to not avoid the unloving behaviour. Never avoid it. Always address it. It's very important to always address unloving behaviour. AJ, I was just going to ask, in that scenario, say with Gemma, who's obviously created this Facebook page, yep. or in Phoebe's case, if she starts a, starts group, a group here, yep. 
if there's someone else, say I was a member of the group, yep. um, if there was an issue of love that was raised within the group and Phoebe didn't address it, yep. is it unloving of me to then address it as a member but not the sort of... I would still address it. If I'm present with anybody, I address the issues that are unloving. However, if she has the leadership of the group, then it's up to Phoebe to, to address this issue permanently. Does that make sense? So you can go and create another group that's more loving if you wish, but if you kept going along to a group that was per, you know, consistently unloving in its behaviour, then you'd have to consider... You, you well, can't change her... And it's not right to even change her when she is the person who established the group. But you can talk to her privately and if she has an open heart, she'll probably listen to that. Does that make sense? But you can't actually physically change her or, or force her to change. So, so if she, after a few times you mention it and she still didn't want to address the issue um, and it was an issue of love that was quite apparent to you, then you don't have to go to the group and you could start your own group. What happens with a lot of people, though, is they don't start their own group because they're afraid of exactly the same thing happening to them <laughs> that's happening in the group, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and this is what was happening for Gemma as well. Like She was sitting there observing it, and then she was thinking... Uh, one of the, she, she emailed me a heap of options of things that she was considering, and it was quite interesting, some of the options, because a lot of them were options like disclaiming any responsibility for the group that she'd created, walking away from the group and just letting them do what they wanted to do, and there's all these other options... And I mentioned to her that a person who begins a group does have a of any type, not just a divine truth group, but any type of group, has a responsibility to keep the group loving. Just like any person who begins a company has a responsibility to keep the company loving. Any person that you know does anything has a responsibility to do to whatever that thing is that is being done to keep it loving. And when we don't keep it loving, there is a certain you know part of our soul that has an effect on when we don't choose to do that. And usually we don't choose to do it because of fear. Yet fear is our primary motivator generally that causes us to, not, you know, to overlook unloving behaviour around us and not address it. So the, as Glenn pointed out, the beauty of addressing the issues is that many, some people will be very upset you know, and they are the people who want to continue being unloving. All the people who want to continue being unloving get upset all the people who want to become loving, they all say, well, no, that makes sense. You know, like We want to be all more loving, so we need to address this issue in a loving manner. Um, we've encouraged Gemma, though, to make sure that she doesn't restrict people's free expression of feelings, but we've got to be careful that the free expression of feelings don't revert into unloving behaviour or unloving... Yeah, or, or even slander or verbal attacks on others. Uh, microphone, thank oh, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, because uh, I, I noticed, like, there is the, the problem is, yeah, often people, um, instead of asking, like, say, questions or making criticism with a, you know, a clear premises and, uh, you know, so that's in a loving way, yep. just making a claim or yep. um, criticising what you say or saying this can't be true because of that, yep. or looking for inconsistencies, which is, which is not unloving, right? Yep. Um, so, yeah, it, it is important to let people do that, just not with the projection and the... Um, yeah, is that correct? That's yeah. correct. It's the so attack. So you can say, you know... It's the anger, um, the ridicule, yeah. and other emotions yeah. that are all unloving. But, 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 but um, s you know, any kind of, um, you, know, log log you know, logical criticism and stuff is, is of course, fine. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, okay, great. I just, <laughs> thought, uh, some, I, I just thought if I went to a group, maybe people would be... Um, not like certain questions because, um, for example, like, you know, I can't understand well how, you know, with the last thing you were talking about, um, for example, a lion has um, sharp teeth, it's clearly built to eat meat, therefore attack another animal. So how is it made to... Um, well, you that doesn't I've answered the question probably 20 times in different presentations. I've never heard it. Where, where, where do I look? Um, well, I can't remember <laughs> what presentations are, but, tell me. but I've answered them in many presentations. Um, and it, I don't see it as an inconsistency. And if you take the attitude that every question can be resolved, then you wouldn't be attacking. Does that make sense? So, so a person who's attacking yeah, okay. or ridicule it would go, oh, that's a stupid thing to say. Why, why would he say that kind of thing without finding any background? Mm -hmm. Whereas a person who is in wanting knowledge would say, well, you said that and it doesn't make much sense to me. Can you explain? 
Yeah. Does that make sense? So the attitude just, is completely different. I was just seeing that. Yeah, just seeing that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, so it, it really does depend upon the motivation and the attitude. If the motivation and the attitude is one of discovery, one of desire to know, desire to answer questions, then any form of illogical things that occur need to be clarified, right? You know, and a lot of times in discussions, I am giving an answer to a specific problem with a specific person and then other people want to apply it to lots of other different things, right? Which is not logical to do so because every single individual problem has its own cause. So, so, but unfortunately, because we all like having rules, we'd like to do that rather than have to feel about the different things. So it's very important that we understand it's the attitude by which, pe by, you know, by which people act that is what we're addressing here. So if the attitude is one of anger, ridicule, making fun of, you know, and, and particularly when people revert to personal attack. You know, so it's like saying, it's like me looking at Mary and going, yeah, Mary, like, you, your legs are far too long for your body. Like, you know, that's a personal attack and a personal opinion it has nothing to do with truth. But I might know that Mary was a bit upset about that and and it might just be a great way of just making her feel worse about herself does that make sense and and when the goal is to make people feel worse about themselves then obviously it's way out of harmony with love when the goal is to love them and address the issue with love then it's totally different so we need to be very careful that we have the courage to address issues we need to do so in harmony with the free will of individuals but we need to understand that any attack or slander or anger or ridicule aimed at a person in order to tear them down and harm them is totally out of harmony with love and therefore not acceptable in any group, whether the group is on the internet or in, in you know, in face-to-face -face group or, or any type of group for any reason. And so what we're trying to do in the God's Way of Love organisation is to address those issues as well with every single group. So in the God's Way of Love organisation, we've actually removed people who have displayed any of those attitudes straight away. A any person who wants to waste the time of a whole group, we, rem we ask them to leave um, because they are not displaying love to, to another person and they are demonstrating through their actions that they don't have any desire to love. Does that make sense? If we have the mic. Yes, sorry, Wait. It's fine to ask questions. Eh? Sorry, I, I just forgot to, to yeah. ask the, the main one. I, mean, yeah. I remember the, the first talk I went to in Armadale, um, I was because uh, I found some some things um, a bit hard to understand, and I had both logical issues with it and emotional. But I wanted to deal um, try to deal with both. But I remember when I asked somebody who was um, I think she was like oh anyway um, so she was the medium's or the uh, wife or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I it seemed to me, and I wanted to know you know what's the policy here. Um, that when I asked the question, instead of uh, answering the question um, and dealing with, oh, I have ish, uh, emotional issues with it, that I, which, I, which I knew, um, it was just a, a blaming my own emotions for it rather than actually trying to answer the question or just prejudging. So I just saw that as a bit of a problem if, um, yeah, if that happens in a group where like, well, well the, other the thing question is blamed on the emotions rather than... Well, the other thing you've got to remember is that every single person associated with the divine truth is a work in progress at the moment. Yeah. What we want to do, though, is not accept the particular behaviour that is unloving. So, so I've already spoken to the person that you've um, oh. talked to about the issue and, uh, and talked to her about her own emotional response to, to okay. yourself um, without you knowing, actually. Because I, I saw you talking at the corner, I thought, oh, they're blaming me. <laughs> Yeah, but that <laughs> there was also a large yeah. amount of anger coming from you I, I that was, I observed. I, I felt a lot of anger, I know that. Exactly. So, yeah. so, you know, the reality is we often judge people through our own emotional filters. Yeah. And, and what we've got to get used to doing is stopping doing that and starting to say, well, hang a sec, yeah, I am angry, so obviously there is something in this for me that I need to address emotionally yeah. that, that is out of harmony with love. Yeah. And yeah. for her, she was also angry. And so there is something inside of her, which I've already addressed, which was out, yeah. out of harmony with love. Does I that make sense? No, I remember the incident because I was going to go um, in the car alone to um, deal with that, that emotion, but then I got distracted by the free food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was another emotion, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
So, and, and we also need to be aware that at times we have emotions coming out of us that we have no idea of. So, so some of the emotions coming, like for example for yourself, there's this emotion coming out almost of a very strong demand that you be answered is coming out of you before you begin. So, so that the, anybody who's in a group with you will automatically feel that as a demand, if that makes sense. And, and so some of them might point that out to you and then that might make you angry and then, well, now that we're in angry, now it's not good. You know, it's like we need to feel the feeling inside of us without actually blaming everyone around us for that particular feeling. And if I feel that if everyone has a feeling that, that we are all works in progress, we won't tolerate unloving behaviour with each other, but we will at least investigate unloving behaviour with each other. In other words, we won't just blame each other for the unloving behaviour, but rather we'll go, oh, no, that was unloving, and I can see, yes, my anger is unloving too, and, we'll, and we can admit to ourselves that we've got certain problems, then we can address the issues of love in the interaction. If we go straight into attacking or slandering or ridiculing someone or making fun of them or laughing at them or, you know, all those kind of things, then now we're way, way away from acting in harmony with love and that needs to be addressed. You know, we need to stop that kind of behaviour from occurring in groups. So in what I've been doing recently in presentations is every time I have a person in the audience like that, I've been addressing the issue so that you can see how the issue can be addressed. Does that make sense? And I just feel, I do feel that it is a problem for many groups and in the God's Way of Love uh, stuff that we're doing as well, it has been a problem that we are addressing and we're, we're actually working with every team leader to have the courage to, you know, to stand up for love and truth even though it might be difficult and uh, and to you know remove the unloving behavior if it continues and so um, and then if it continues regularly to permanently remove so there are some people now that we have permanently asked to not come along to anything to do with the god's way of love organization they still come along to seminars and stuff but we've asked them to not come along with anything to do with god's way of love organization until they are ready to address the emotion that we've pointed out to them as to why they're angry all the time or why they want to take up other people's time all the time or why they want to boss people around all the time or so forth. So if you can remember that with the group um, and also understand it's your group. Do you understand what I mean by that? In the sense that any person who begins a group, we have the responsibility as the person who seeds the group to maintain the group's loving behaviour. So, so we need... If we're going to start a group, we need to actually accept the responsibility of any unloving behaviour that occurs in the group and address it. Because if we don't address it, the, the we're tacitly supporting unloving behaviour. And that's not good to do, to do that at all for anybody who comes along. And one of the reasons why people have been repelled from the divine truth uh, over the last three or four years is the actual Facebook pages that, where people have been very unloving. And that's one thing that's caused the repulsion of many people as a result. And we need to see that as a problem, you know. Yeah, there was some um, interesting stuff. And I, I can't remember once bringing anything up that was being said uh, apart from asking the question, is your action loving or not? Exactly. And it was constant. Yeah. And then they were using free will... Um, law of attraction, uh, everything come out as from justification everywhere. for unloving behaviour. And, and I still yeah. said, but hang on, the first need of basic is love. And if you're speaking to someone and talking about someone else on the group unlovingly, yeah. Jo Joy mentioned something one night, and it was just nice. Yeah. And then this barrage come from three or four people, and I just asked the question again and again and again. Yeah. And there was ten or fifteen, and not once was a question answered. What's yeah. loving? And and it's often that case. But yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Joseph, Joy, <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Far away. I, I, I thought I was very open and honest and courageous and then I received lots of attacks and then Glenn yep. defended me. Yep, yep. <laughs> and it felt really good. <laughs> 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 so I, I 
felt yeah, I'm feeling that I have to defend you too. <laughs> yeah, I don't. People said it, I AJ feel there is need. not a need to defend an individual, but oh, there is no, always just, a need to I defend just the truth. I said this is divine love, and this kind of talks got nothing to do divine uh, exactly. with divine love. So what I just said is important to remember. So it's not important to defend the individual. It's very important to defend the truth. A lot of people say, oh, the truth doesn't need defense. If you believe that, then it's no wonder the world's in a mess because the truth does need defense. It doesn't need violence. It doesn't need anything like that. It needs defense. It needs to be spoken. And uh, when the truth is spoken, then things can change. And the reality is I would <coughs> honour the truth no matter what the circumstance and who it is with. Yep. It might be my injury, I don't know, but I got an in incent. If you knock a brother or a sister, it's knocking you and it just... Well, it's, it's doing far worse than that, actually. To your own core yeah. and I yeah. just couldn't... I don't like to see those things because it's an attack on everyone. It's the whole... Yeah. You know, thing and it just wasn't right. And if I see that, I try and help in that way. They'll get a few little in, and we'll just see. Yeah. And, but if it heads, in I feel it's going to head in a better direction yeah. now. Then, um, and and partly is because Gemma has a desire to address some of her fears and emotions that caused her to create the page in the first place, but also to step back from it when she needed to really engage it. There's a deep responsibility that we face when we create groups, even on the internet. And if we can see that as a responsibility to act in harmony with love and truth and to do so to the best of our ability at the time, bearing in mind that we might need to correct ourselves later, um, then we, will, we won't go astray. You know, it's when, uh, it's when the words of truth are used with no love at all and the words of truth are used with lots of lies and slander and, and all other things, then uh, that's when we need to step up and say, and be counted, you know, as people. We need to be step up and be counted and say, no, enough's enough now. You're out of here. Um, and we don't have to be violent, but uh, the reality is we do have to learn to restrict the behaviour of people who are unloving. And, and to do it in a loving way, not, not to do it out of rage or anger ourselves, because that wouldn't be loving. Um, we need to restrict their behaviour in a loving manner. So, you know, there are many people in the world who believe themselves to know me and to know my personal life and circumstances, much of which is false. And, uh, and they carry on as if they think it's true. Of course, they never state it publicly a lot of the times, or they d if they do, they're often slanderous. And I'm not too concerned about all of those things. But I, but I, um, I am just as concerned about them slandering me as anybody else, to be frank. And and if it was my, it's not my, like the divine love forum on the Facebook is not my forum. So it's not my right to even tell anybody what to do with it, or even to tell them uninvited what to do with it. Um, bearing in mind also, I'm not on Facebook, so I can't actually see what's going on. But. Um, but if someone comes along to me, like Gemma has, and says to me, um, AJ, well, I've got this problem on this forum. It's been going on now for years, which I could deserve, deserve it has. And Mary was a member of Facebook, so she saw it happening. And, and then says, what can I do about it? Then I'm perfectly happy to give them the advice about what to do about it and, uh, and make that advice harmonious with love and truth in the process. But it, but it is not my right to control what you do with a group. Um, what you do with a group is your, the group is your creation, so therefore it is your responsibility. And how loving or unloving that group is, is your responsibility. All I can do is say or teach what I'm teaching, as long as it's harmonious with love and truth. So if you take the same approach, I use notice with uh, God's Way of Love, which is an organisation I have started, I am completely responsible. And so I take very positive, straightforward action in every ca case about unloving behaviour that I observe in that organisation. And that's my responsibility as one of the directors of that organisation. Um, but, but when somebody starts the Facebook page, uh, it's got nothing to do with me, it's not e I'm not even responsible for that page and what happens on that page. The person who created it is responsible. Yep. And they need to take those actions, uh, positive actions, to bring it into a loving, a loving place. Yeah. Does everyone understand the principles? Like, 
Yeah. You tell people why they're being <laughs> 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 but basically stuff like t telling people what their unloving behaviour is, um, giving them a warning, warning, and if you have to expel them, tell them exactly why. Exactly. Without being without crazy. being angry. Yeah. Without being if so I'm angry doing that then I'm out of harmony with love myself yeah. and I'd have to expel myself as much as yeah. I'd have to expel yeah. them. Yeah. Well, that probably feel it's fairer then. <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> but see, there's a lot, of, a lot of people believe certain behaviour is unloving when it is not too. So a lot of people, like there's a lot of people in the world, if you just tell them the truth, they think you're being unloving. You know, so, so you've got to be careful about how far you go with rules about all these things. Generally, you can feel the feeling in the person and you can feel whether it's loving or not. And, uh, and collectively, if the group feels that it's unloving or a lot of people in the group feels it's unloving, that's a fairly good sign that it's possibly unloving. However, that's not always true either. And this is why the responsibility has to finish up resting with the person who created the group. Because they are the person who created it, therefore it's their responsibility to determine what was loving or unloving. Nobody else is in the group. So they could disagree with everyone in the group. <laughs> And the person who created a group could ask everyone in the group to leave if they wanted to and still be within their right because they were the person who created the group. Yep. Uh, Mike? <coughs> Just on the, the, well, the Facebook group on the internet. Yeah. That taught me that if you're going... I, f I found that group myself and asked to join and yep. so I was overjoyed at finding this group. And yep. then you go along over these months and see what happens, you know. And, and a lot of terrible things stuff. that happened. Yeah. But that taught me that if you're going to be a person who thinks they want to join a group, that you must examine your expectations. Exactly. So there's also an onus on the person who joins the group to actually know what they want from that group, what they're expecting from that group. Yes. And then make decisions about whether or not they're going to be in that group. Yes. It's not about the group just being what you think it should be. I agree. If we take the even further though, there's also this, if you think about it, what the group together, there's probably a few, I don't know how many people are on it, but there might be a hundred or two, I don't know. Um, how many? 156. 156, okay. So there's about 150 people on the group, right? Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so there's 150 people on the group their combined law of attraction attracted some very nasty people onto the group. Now, now, what they would all need to do is look at why they didn't ask these people to leave a long time ago. And that is a lot to do with our tolerance of people's unloving behaviour. So that's a part of the law of attraction that attracted it to the group. Does that make sense? So while we can ask people to leave who are being unloving, we also must e examine, the whole group needs to examine their own feelings and go, why have we attracted this person? And, and, and as you can see on the group, there are many people in the group who tacitly supported the unloving behaviour as well. So why has the group attacked that? Sorry, you just... Yeah, but the you problem just leave with the, group, which the problem is still with just leaving. Yeah, the problem with just leaving is you're still not addressing the issue of truth anyway. So, so this is a problem. <laughs> you see, no matter which way you look at it. That's exactly right. Mm. So it's been an opportunity, I think, for self-reflection. Definitely. Can, you can turn it into an opportunity for self-reflection, and you can start to learn a lot about yourself, even if you haven't got to the point where you can actually verbalise your thinking exactly in that group you can still learn about yourself you can if you're self-reflective that's right yeah that was all i wanted to say that's no, very true and but we need to also bear in mind that as a group we have a collective law of attraction in those particular groups and if all of us examine ourselves we go oh okay you know we've attracted a few people who are just attack 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 ridicule 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 and we're all just sitting in there going no worries no worries no worries why are we all doing that that's not what I mean. sorry you can even think well, that's not upset. if we do the mic and think, oh, well, I've got to the point where that doesn't upset me anymore, so my LOA has changed. You can actually use everything to hoodwink yourself if you, you can. want to. Yes. So you could actually go, you could actually be saying to yourself, like, oh, that doesn't upset me, but hang on a sec, why am I not engaging it? Why am I not saying this is wrong? See, there's, there's an issue there too. Why am I not saying 
you know, this unloving behaviour is wrong. Why, am I, why aren't I emailing all of the people who are the moderators or whatever or the people who started the group and saying, this behaviour is wrong, what are you doing about it? <laughs> you know, because, because if I really love truth and love love, I will take notice of when things are out of harmony with love and truth and I will speak up. And, and so I don't see any problem with speaking up for what you know to, not, to be not true or true either way. Um, I do see a problem with how it's done. Like if the, if the reason why it's taken is because we're angry or upset or then, then we're out of harmony with love ourselves. If we're doing it because we just want the truth to be known and we want you know, everything to be sorted out like that, then of course it makes sense to do it. And we should do it, in fact. We have an onus, in fact, a responsibility to do so. Yeah. Yep. It's why even at the time I felt because um, you, you go through that whole stage, it was like five or six different things. Yep. Like I just spoke up and said, and I yep. said, you, it's not wrong to speak to people like that. Yep. And it wasn't just that they were talking about, say, yourself, they were talking about joy, they were talking about someone else commenting, and then there was three and four. Yep. But then, like, you know, I made sure they <laughs> took note that you can't speak to people this way and made it fully noted. Yes. And then there was another, the conscious of the group, there was another four or five people who came out under all these other understandings to try and say that they justified it. And I just answered all them back and I told them exactly what I was going to do. You either do this or that. Yeah. And yep. they said, well, we're happy to put up with that. And I just said, bye. Why? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but why? then, why? <laughs> I tried everything I could, went yeah. through the whole process. I never attacked anybody. Yes. Although some took some of the questions as attacked. Exactly. Just said, yeah. And just left it at that. And then I said, well, I'll see you next time. I started the other group in Mildura, which unbeknownst to anybody else, was not about leaving the other group. No. It was purely about Mildura because yeah, we've got more a group local. there of people and yeah. we wanted to collect them together. Yeah. And then he started his own and then all this started. And yeah, all presumption. Like, yeah, about... Unloving nothing. presumptions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just, you know, you go... And like Sometimes said, myself and Mary hear of all these things uh, and we go... <laughs> <laughs> uh. but, but I was... <laughs> yeah, it was, is like watching Home in a Way. Yeah, and but it happens a bit faster. <laughs> yeah. Re reference to the sand pit was interesting, you know. I yep. Actually, that was an insult to five and six-year-olds. I think they handle it better. But um, uh, it was yeah. just interesting. And I, I found that I was happy even after, even though at times I walk away from the computer and I said, you can just sit there for an hour because I went away and, geez, did I have a crack. I mean, I think Cassie heard a couple of them. And when I come back, I went, no, nah, that's better. Now yeah, I'm in a space to answer. Now, space to right <laughs> now I'm back at it, you know, and then yeah. left it at that and then went yeah. away. But now, seriously, I can see how Gemma's done a good job in just getting the environment right again. It's yeah. been such a refresh. And, and yeah. it, it all revolved around three, maybe four max. Yeah. It only takes two or three or four people. Well, it actually really only takes one person yeah. out of harmony with love and everyone else accepting the behaviour for, a, for a something to go from a very good condition of love down to a very dark condition. And, um, and it, it's very interesting how that happens generally. And often myself and Mary hear about these things and go, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people who still need to learn about free will and learn about living in harmony with love and truth. And, and when we are asked directly, then we'll give an answer about it. But it's not up to us to give an answer to somebody who hasn't asked either. And so it was only very recently, a few a month or so ago, that Gemma actually asked about the situation and how to deal with it, because her own conscience was starting to bother her that she'd started the group, and and so she'd started realizing, ah, oh, you know, I've got to do something about this. So that so that was good, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel that these groups have a large potential to help lots of people actually if they're operated harmoniously with love and truth. If they're, if they're operated where a person who can just get on there and be nasty and, and attack and attack and attack and attack and a lot of times say a lot of things that are untrue and false and in the process of attacking or stuff that's unsubstantiated even, then all it does is give them... It, it's like giving a nasty person a forum to say whatever they want and that's not a very loving thing to do. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that's clarified what it's like to feel a, like to lead a group, particularly for yourself, Phoebe, if you're going to do one in Adelaide. 
Yeah. But yeah, it's good though. Like it's a process I need to go through, I think. And yeah, honestly, if you do begin a group, it is one of the fastest ways to grow yeah. if you engage the process. Mm. And so this is where I feel that there's many, there's a lot of potential in the world not being realised yet uh, surrounding divine truth because many people would be better off engaging a group mm. and then engaging the unloving behaviour and actually having to work through the issues of mm. unloving behaviour. Mm. Uh, that would be far more powerful than what a lot of people are doing currently, which is as soon as the unloving behaviour happens, they go, oh, I don't know what to do. I, I think I'll just go away and they mm. <laughs> avoid the, the actual confrontation between truth and error that needs to occur. Yeah, yeah. and to learn about humility, I think. It's and to learn to be humble yeah. and to learn to be so self-reflective. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful that you want to do that such a thing. It's a like I said, it's a difficult job, and I, I often think myself is if I couldn't travel and everything, one of the fastest things to do nowadays would be to actually, if you couldn't travel and you're quite homebound or whatever, and one of the fastest things to uh, do with a lot of your own emotions is to start an internet forum on any subject and then to run it in harmony with love, <laughs> and you know a lot of things would come up in that process. Yeah, yeah. Mary, you want to? No? You just want to yawn. <laughs> she wants to go to we, we were up to midnight last night. Yeah. So a bit late. Uh, we do have to make a decision about tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. What would uh, you like to do tomorrow? Well, Who, who's going to be around tomorrow if we do something tomorrow? So, about. So, yeah, most of us. Okay. Um, okay, is it going to rain tomorrow? Does anyone know? You see, I'm responsible for Adelaide's weather. <laughs> so <what> you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't feel it's likely. Um, yeah. So, do you want to do a park? Would you li like to do it at a park or something? Have lunch at a park or somewhere, or down the botanical gardens or something like that? Botanical gardens, are nice. Um, now, I, so last time I've been to botanical gardens was seven years ago. Um, has it changed much? <laughs> for those of you, who anyone are local? Who's, who's local? There's a, is there still a pond where all the fish are in and everything right at the entry uh, or near the entry, the, you know, a little way in? There's still a pond there. Um, okay. And where the, where the kiosk or the yeah. cafe is, that's still there? Uh, it would have to be eight years solid, I'd say. Yeah. Has there? What if we just met at the pond at midday or something like that? Assuming the pond's still there, that's the that's There is a pond in front of a restaurant near the botanical we gardens. This oh, you were there this morning. <laughs> oh, in the botanical gardens. So there is one, and you were there this morning. Okay, so we've got no problems with that. So what if we meet there? What do you reckon around midday or something like that? Yeah, have, have bring some picnic lunch. Um, and if you want to call our number, oh by the way, if I just give you that, um, we don't need to recall the rest of this now. 